Let us pray. Almighty God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. As prodigal sons and daughters, as we find our way home, illumine that way through your word, your word made flesh in Jesus Christ. Open our hearts, our minds, our ears, that we might hear your word. In his name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, and then 11 through 32 which can be found in your Pew Bible on page 1065. Uh, This is a familiar text, uh, the story of the prodigal son. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But when he was still a long way off, His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Quick! Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Let the fattened calf, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, The older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. 
So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your, your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is a, suffice it to say, a familiar parable. I wonder, Norm, in 54 years, how many times you must have preached on the prodigal son? Just in, okay, at least 15 times, yeah? <laughs> I've only been doing this for 15 some years, and I've lost count. It shows up in the lectionary more than once, and, well, quite frankly, it gets pulled out for good reason. It gets told and retold again and again because every time, like much of Scripture, every time we go to it, we find something new and something different. And it's a story that we need to tell and we need to hear and we need to live again and again and again. It's funny how God works things out sometimes. I had some advanced preparation for this text just a little bit ago. The group that is meeting on Sunday evenings and studying the challenging topic of forgiveness discussed this particular parable in depth. And to those who are attending that group, I want to thank you because you helped me reflect on this in ways that were new and fresh. I want us this morning to think about this parable, this parable that we know so well, in light of forgiveness. One of the things I have thoroughly enjoyed about this group that's meeting on, uh, on Sunday evenings and studying forgiveness. One of the things I've enjoyed is hearing from each of the people involved how hard this is. Forgiveness is not easy. It costs us, the people who are forgiving, a great deal. And to those who are forgiven, they have to be willing to receive and forgive themselves. 
Forgiveness, as we've been listening to uh, again and again in this group, we've been listening to a song by Matthew West, a contemporary Christian singer, and the title of his song appropriately is Forgiveness. And he's got, it's, it's a wonderful and beautiful approach to forgiveness. He says, when the jury and the judge say you have a right to hold a grudge, even when it's justified, forgiveness. It's what you give away. It's free. But it costs you still forgiveness. So let's think about forgiveness in terms of this text. It is so easy to think of the prodigal son, the wayward son, the first one. He says to his dad, I want my inheritance now. Since you haven't died yet, I'll take it now. Thank you. And the father gives it to him. He goes off into a foreign land. He squanders it. You know how the story goes. He prepares a speech. I'm not worthy to be your son. Treat me as one of your servants. He goes home. His father sees him, runs to meet him. How undignified for a patriarch. He runs to greet this son who is dead to him and lost. And he doesn't even let his son get through his well-prepared speech. He cuts him off and begins preparations for throwing a great big party and a celebration for this son who was lost has been found. If that isn't forgiveness... I don't know what is. The father has every reason to be angry and bitter and hurt. But he does, does he bring that up? It doesn't even, even seem like it crosses his mind. He is so overwhelmed with joy because he's got his son back. Then there's the older brother. I have to admit, in all the years that I have preached on this text, I have spent more time on the younger son than I have on the older brother. So this morning, this is really who we are looking at. Now, the older brother, it would be very easy for us to just write him off as an angry, bitter, resentful man who is only worried about himself and could care less about his younger brother and actually has contempt for his own father. Did you hear the words he said to his father? He says, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you've never given me even a young goat that I might go celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, do you hear it? It's dripping with blame and contempt and anger. When this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, You killed the fatted calf for him. Yeah, it would be really easy for us to just write off the uh, 
the older brother in this story as just a genuinely bad apple. But I have to say, I have a bit of a soft spot in my heart for the elder brother because I'm the oldest of three. It's not easy. Anybody else here the oldest of the siblings? Okay, there's a few of you then who know what I'm talking about. There is that sense of responsibility. There is that sense of, well, you have to get it just right. People-pleasing we call it, that is definitely a downfall of the oldest. With being the oldest comes lots of attention, but as the youngest will tell you, too much attention sometimes can be a bad thing. Because after all, when you're the youngest, you can get away with anything. But when there is focused attention on you, well, you get away with nothing. And after all, there is in sibling world and sibling talk the uh, concept of divide and conquer. The more siblings there are, the less attention and time and energy there is from mom and dad. Divide and conquer. But not so for the oldest, because at least in those very formative years and experience, the oldest had all of the attention, for better or worse. Books have been written about families and birth order and all of this, and I am by no means an expert, though I have a little bit of experience with this. Books have been written about uh, family systems and how we are not simply a product of nature and just our, our genetics, but we are also a product of how we are loved and the family that we live in. We are a product of the relationships that we have with each other. And every family is a system. Everybody works together and has their role. And the roles that we play in our family of origin have a way of following us in the rest of our lives. In fact, a great deal of time is spent in the church training pastors in family systems theory to help not only pastors but congregations recognize the, way that, the ways that we automatically respond without even thinking. We just say something and we wonder where did that come from? I know as a parent, the first time that happened to me, Joel and Hannah were young, too young to understand, and they were fighting with each other like brother and sister do. They were fighting with each other and it was starting to get kind of nasty with name calling. And so I decided it's finally time to intercede. And so I opened my mouth and my mother came out. <laughs> that ever happened to you? I opened my mouth and I said, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. And in that moment, I hated myself. 
because I had sworn to myself that I would never say that because I knew how frustrating it was. And yet I said it. In fact, I said it so often that all I had to say was, if you don't have anything nice to say, and they would finish the rest of it. Think about this story from a family systems perspective. Think about the older son and the younger son. They didn't just wake up one day and have this catastrophe happen. We might say it was brewing for years. In fact, we were talking about this in the forgiveness group that meets on Sunday evenings. And, uh, you know, there is a certain extent of jealousy, of resentment that is just natural between siblings. Unfortunately, it just happens. And a lot of it grows out of seeking approval from the parent. Hmm. Maybe Freud was right about a few things. So we have these brothers, one who has squandered everything, one who has been faithful. Which do you think has experienced forgiveness and mercy and joy? Yeah, the younger brother. Imagine how overwhelming it would feel to have the slate wiped clean. To be welcomed back in such a way that your father throws a party. And then imagine what it would be like to be the older brother. And to carry within your heart such bitterness and contempt, such anger and unforgiveness. You see, anger and unforgiveness is like taking a poison pill and swallowing it and hoping that the other person dies. It's no good. All it does is eat us up inside. Even when the jury and the judge say you have a right to hold a grudge, forgiveness. I have to say that Honestly, if, not if, when I meet the Lord, I would like to hear the end of his story. Remember, after all, this is a parable. It's a teaching story. There was no real prodigal son. This is a story that Jesus uh, is telling in order to teach and make a point. But I want to hear what happens to that older brother. Because in reality, sometimes I am him. I want to be the one who lives forgiven, who lives in freedom, who is experiencing God's grace. But sometimes I am that older brother who holds grudges. Don't raise your hand. Don't answer me. But consider in your mind, are you sometimes also that older brother? I don't know the end of Jesus' parable, not until he tells me. But I do know the end of all parables. 
I do know the end of all stories. They all end the same way. They all end at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. They all end on Easter morning with resurrection. For that is where the slate is wiped clean. That is where we are forgiven. That is where we find the Father running in the distance to come and welcome us, prodigal sons and daughters, both older and younger siblings, where the Father runs to welcome us home. Friends, this is good news. It's it's forgiveness. Amen. Please stand as you are able for our affirmation of faith, which comes from Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 8, as is printed in our bulletin. We believe there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. We are convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Fellow prodigal sons and daughters, older brothers, younger brothers, older sisters, younger sisters, Let us live our lives forgiven and knowing that in Jesus Christ we are set free and restored in the family of God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit abide with all of us today, tomorrow, and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.